Hello, and welcome to this information video about the statewide needs assessment in Massachusetts. I am Samantha Lowry from ICF Incorporated and here on behalf of the Massachusetts Office for Victim Assistance as the principal investigator for this study. Today, I'll be talking about how through this needs assessment, we'll be gathering the voices of victims and survivors across the Commonwealth. All right, so in this video, you will hear about the overall needs assessment and the purpose behind these efforts. I will also share about um, how these efforts engage providers um, across the state, those offering services, as well as victims and survivors themselves. We will focus mainly on gathering the perspectives of victims and survivors um, throughout this video to just share a little bit about a few key areas. We're gonna be talking about safety, privacy and confidentiality, as well as discussing how to participate, how to get involved and who really is being captured within some of these focus groups. So let's begin. Let's start by talking about what we're doing with this needs assessment. What is the purpose behind the needs assessment? In order to answer each of these areas on the previous slides, um, let's begin with sharing about the purpose and why we are working with MOVA on this needs assessment. So as you can see here, the purpose of the needs assessment is really to give service providers, victims, survivors a voice. We we're asking questions about strengths in the current service delivery approach, gaps and challenges in the victim service provision, just really soliciting feedback to inform funding decisions, policy making, um, and on service provision across the state. Um, so gathering all of these various perspectives to look to data that is already in existence, to gather new insights, and really weave this all together to share back recommendations. So building off of the purpose that I just described, there are a variety of ways to do this. So to answer each of these key areas, we're gathering data from a, a variety of sources. One being a survey of service providers, talking with service providers, state coalitions, local task forces, just programs um, that are serving communities of color and all the various communities across the state. Gathering their perspectives to really feed into what are some of the gaps that they've identified? How are service provisions being offered and addressed across the state? And then also talking about the perspectives of those being served. So the clients that providers are serving across the state, um, sharing from their perspective as well. This is conducted through virtual focus groups um, from individuals that sought services from the program, individuals that were interested in services. It really does touch on a variety of of groups and victims and survivors across the Commonwealth. We also want to look at information that's already been collected. So looking at administrative data, um, looking at outcomes that have been tracked by victim service providers and really building off of what providers have been collecting over time and using within other various reporting systems. And the environmental scan, it's really just our way of saying, we're gonna be looking at all of the documentation across the state, the various initiatives, to really wrap that all together. This can be strategic planning initiatives, um, diversity and inclusion needs and programming, um, succession and sustainability planning, and other data collection and evaluation efforts that have been underway. So we're asking for folks to provide feedback from various perspectives so that we have this comprehensive, well-rounded approach. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing on the virtual focus groups. That's gonna be the highlight, answering all of the key questions about who might be eligible to participate. How can they get involved? What will it feel like and look like within a virtual session? And we'll be covering all of the various questions that we received when we've conducted efforts like this in other areas. So to give you a little bit more information about the needs assessment overall, here are the four key areas that I just mentioned. So first, the virtual focus groups who is targeted in, in within this data collection. So we're talking about victims, survivors, caregivers, clients that are served by providers across the state. The topics that are included, um, you can see here on the screen, so awareness of and access to services, talking about really experiences receiving those services and gathering recommendations from victims, survivors and caregivers themselves about what are the needs of survivors. Um, what are some recommendations they may have for areas for improvement or areas that were really um, a strength of the response. Um, within this virtual focus groups, we are offering incentives. So it's a $50 gift card. And we're really estimating about 20 to 25 
groups, um, just ranging in size. So some of these groups will be about eight participants large, um, others can be much smaller. Um, we're really here just to gather folks um, in a comfortable setting to share their perspectives. Some of the other efforts that you'll hear about or you may see underway on the web-based survey, this was sent out to service providers and allied professionals. If you haven't received it from us and you're interested, I should be sharing contact information at the end and you can go ahead and send us a note and we'll get you engaged there. Um, but there are a variety of topics shared within this survey where service providers are able to talk about outreach and awareness, barriers to service delivery, um, crime victims needs identified through intake, collaboration, cultural competency, service coordination, strengths of service organizations, talking about recommendations from the service provider perspective. Service providers have the opportunity to look across all of the clients that they're serving and really share about some of those themes and areas that are in need of additional resources. And then again, just giving a nod to the existing data. We absolutely want to build from what has been captured across the state. So looking to what service providers are already collecting um, through some of the reporting mechanisms, whether it's to MOVA or other outlets, um, such as the outcome measurement tool, um, looking at performance measures and in, in various reports um, to really pull together what's been documented in other states, um, comparing that to what's been going on in Massachusetts to make sure that we are comprehensively um, addressing each of the key areas. An environmental scan is an, a last area, and that is really just a systematic review of documentation. So as I mentioned on the prior slide, it's looking at things such as strategic planning initiatives, um, any other um, like um, programs in the state. So if there are other evaluations looking to a needs assessment that was conducted years ago um, and comparing a bit there, um, looking at victim service programs and efforts that they have underway to evaluate and document the service needs um, of victims and survivors. So really pulling together all that we can across the Commonwealth. All right, so let's dive into the focus groups themselves. So what is the purpose of the focus group um, and why are we conducting them? So really the focus groups are to gather that deeper information. We really want to be able to have conversations with victims, survivors, the clients that are served across the state to understand from their perspective, um, their experience accessing services, whether it's barriers, preventing access, if there are particular pieces um, that may have been a little bit easier than others, and looking at the landscape of service needs. What are the needs at that sort of initial stage? Um, how do they differ across each um, group that we speak with? Um, what is the experience with the service provision itself? Are there varying experiences and what are some of the drivers behind those? Thinking about collaboration and coordination, communication among service providers. Um, how does that happen and what is that experience like for victims and survivors themselves? And then of course, thinking about impact on services. And so thinking about impact, we really wanna know sort of what are the benefits of each type of service? Um, what is it that um, victims and survivors are hoping to achieve through that service? And in understanding um, how that receipt of a service um, is influencing their lives. It's also just an opportunity for victims and survivors to share about their service related stories, their experience with services. So think about questions such as, how did you first become aware of services? Were there any gaps in accessing services? And what recommendations do you have to improve services? We're really focused on service provision itself, whether it's at the beginning of that journey, access and understanding at different time points and touch points within the service system, um, and what that, that sort of experience is like for each um, of the individuals accessing care. You might be thinking, so how, how can I participate? Um, how do I get people involved? Who is eligible to participate in these focus groups? So here, what I've covered is a little bit of both of those areas. So let's first start with eligibility and focus on who is going to be sort of um, within these focus groups and able to join um, each of them. So I've mentioned victims, survivors, caregivers, and families. So that's really the group that we're looking for within these focus groups. Um, all of the different sort of views, um, sometimes we've referred to them as clients, other times victims and survivors. Um, for the focus groups themselves, um, these will be um, 18 years of age and older. So the focus groups are focused on adults only. 
Um, we are um, doing data collection or incorporating victims and survivors that are a bit younger than that as well. Um, and so if you have individuals or you are um, a younger survivor, we are including youth ages 13 to 18 um, in interviews. So these will be one-on-one -on -one versus that focus group setting, which is more of a group dynamic. Um, so that does allow for um, a larger group of folks to participate. And one of the other areas to consider in terms of eligibility is just really that readiness to participate in research. Um, this can be from a service provider perspective, this can be self-reported. Um, we really do see a wide range um, of folks in terms of when they're sort of ready to participate, when is it time to talk about service provision, knowing that um, each individual accesses services at a different um, time point as well. But in terms of eligibility, we're looking for all genders, all races, all ethnicities. It's really about being a victim, survivor, caregiver, family member, um, and the age piece of it. Um, it's, it's not meant to exclude anyone else in terms of geography. We're really looking for folks across the entire state. Um, and so we did note here resides in Massachusetts. That's a pretty um, broad way of defining eligibility. And we really are hoping for folks to participate that are receiving services within the state or were sort of eligible for services within the state. And so that's why we've noted here that um, residing in Massachusetts is one of those eligibility pieces. Um, we do understand that some of the clients that are being served, the victims, the survivors um, that may be looking to participate may have experienced their victimization in another state and are now living in Massachusetts, and some of those folks would also be eligible um, to participate as well. And then the last note that I'll say on in terms of eligibility is um, recommending clients with closed criminal cases um, or those that are inactive. Um, and so this is not something that we ask about during um, screening and eligibility. This is more so for those of you that may be a legal service provider and sort of deciding who you might um, sort of recruit or engage um, in the needs assessment, um, understanding that open criminal cases, um, there are some boundaries there. And so um, that is one where um, looking to the closed cases um, is recommended, um, but not sort of the hard and fast rule. We, we sort of defer to your um, knowledge and expertise on um, sort of when it would be good for an individual to participate in, in research based on the status of their case. And what does engagement look like? What is our strategy there? Um, so the way that we're going about this, and it's a strategy we use in many other states, is that we really try to have service providers be sort of that um, beginning um, entree into the needs assessment. So really helping to identify individuals that have been um, served either through their organization or other service organizations, having them contact clients, right? So we, as researchers, do not have existing relationships um, within um, the community. And so we really look to service providers to help be um, that gatekeeper and help make those connections um, for us. And so service providers, um, if you haven't already received information from us, feel free to reach out. Again, my contact information is going to be at the end. Um, but we have this process where we share out information for how do you contact your clients and share about the study? What does the study look like um, for a survivor or a victim that's um, interested in participating? Um, and it kind of gives you some information about how to describe the study um, and share that out either via email or by phone. Um, and then it also shares information about about how to actually engage with us. What does that look like? Um, how do you join um, one of these groups? Um, and so we wanna make sure that that's kind of a, an open door that clients are given the option to join and that it's a choice that they can make whether they wanna participate in the study or not. Um, and so we share out this information with service providers as one way um, to pass along options, whether it's um, varying calendars or varying groups because um, we do have um, dif uh, different groups offered um, across the state um, that uh, folks can sort of self-select um, which one sort of resonates with one with each individual, which one would be the best match for them. Um, also just noting that participation is confidential. And so what I mean by that is 
you know, we are not um, at ICF collecting identifiable information until um, a client agrees to that. We actually have a process, um, which I'll describe here in a minute, um, that does not require sharing of confidential information at all. Um, and so we have um, various steps in place to protect um, who is participating, how they're participating, um, so that it is at the victim or survivor's discretion as to what they do um, share and how they share that. Um, and so that's where when service providers are making those connections, um, it's really for them to make those connections and, and um, give them our information. So we're not reaching out to victims and survivors ourselves. Um, we're actually kind of on a waiting side for folks to come and participate. Um, also, we, we don't share the information back. So we talked about how service providers are kind of that gatekeeper. They're the, the first folks to reach out to um, their clients and share um, about this, this particular study and how to get engaged. Um, once um, victims and survivors participate in a group, we do not circle back and share that information with providers. So we cannot confirm um, whether someone did or did not participate um, once an individual comes to us and participates in the, the focus group or even contacts us at all, um, that information is considered confidential um, and we no longer share that back. Another question you might be considering is, what does virtual participation look like? Um, I know folks really want to sort of visualize what that space might look like, who's going to be there, what are we going to ask about, and so we really wanted to, to try to um, answer that in a number of ways, so you had a good sense of, of what that space is going to um, feel like um, for participants. So the first is, I mentioned it's virtual participation, so it is an online platform, um, and so it's going to feel um, and look similar to this um, video setting um, as well, so it is um, hosted by ICF. It's a considered a virtual meeting space. Um, and so it does allow for that sort of two-way exchange um, where um, per individuals, participants are able to um, speak, um, able to use chat. Um, and I'll describe each of those a little bit here as well. Um, we do utilize a waiting room to do check-in processes. This is really a place where we can um, ensure that the right individuals are participating. And when I say the right individuals, just making sure folks are eligible, that they did come from a, a, a referral of a, from a service provider. Um, and we do this through a process of using identifiers. Um, and so each um, service provider receives a set of identifiers to utilize. Um, and then we do go ahead and you check those upon check-in to make sure that we aren't sort of commingling individuals that were not um, eligible. We do refer to this sometimes as a safety code. It's, it's meant to be that balance and to make sure that um, we don't have folks that um, should not be in, in the room um, participating as well. Um, we don't use video. So we do have the facilitator visible, um, like I am right now, I'm talking with folks in the room. But we actually discourage participants from being on video during these sessions um, because of it being a virtual session and um, recording videos has a different layer um, of confidentiality and um, other elements that um, we do try to avoid in these settings. And so we encourage everyone to stay off video and to more so speak up um, with their, um, their input for each question. Um, I also noted here anonymous login, um, and so what I mean by that is the platform does not require you to utilize your name. Um, no names are required sort of in any aspect of the screen or the meeting setting, um, and so you're able to use an alias, um, you could use your identifier. There are various things that are offered um, in the instructions for each participant that allows them to engage without their names. Um, that is kind of um, our preference as well, right? Because the more information that we um, do not collect, the better, right? We really just want to focus on the insights um, and not who's participating in each group. And then the other piece is that um, knowing these virtual platforms, there's lots of different ways that folks can engage. And so the nice thing about having this virtual participation option is that one, so we don't have the video on, but then how do folks engage? So folks can come off of mute and share verbally. Um, that is um, 
sort of by far the most common way that individuals have engaged with us um, in virtual focus groups um, before. But we also offer private chat options for folks that may not want to share their experiences um, in, in front of the rest of the group. And so there is an option to private chat a facilitator like myself um, so that you can hear the perspectives or share the perspectives um, with the facilitators along the way um, without others seeing those responses. Um, we've had folks that, you know, they um, prefer the chat function and actually type all of their um, responses in there. And sometimes it's because that's their preferred method. They can't come off mute maybe because of the setting that they're in um, and they're okay with those perspectives being shared with the group. And so we read them aloud. And other times it's through that private chat where they very much wanna share their perspectives for the facilitator only. And we absolutely honor that. Um, and so that will um, remain part of our record but is not shared aloud in the rest of the group. And so we have these sort of variety of avenues um, for each individual. Um, we do not allow for in the platform sharing um, participant to participant. Um, it's always with the facilitator involved. And so it's either a chat for the entire group or a chat privately to the facilitator. Um, and so that's one of the um, deviations from that particular aspect of the meeting setting. And then um, just noting that we're, we're not focused on victimization at all in these, um, these questions that we're asking. It's really about service receipt, accessibility of services, the needs of each um, victim and survivor. Um, of course, there are times when victimization kind of plays into each of those pieces. Um, and so we do have a process for, you know, sort of making sure that the conversation um, remains focused on service provision um, and away from victimization itself. Um, and that's mainly just to adhere to um, what it is that we're setting out to do um, in terms of this collection and making sure that we gather the voices of victims and survivors, but also abiding by um, a lot of the sort of rules and regulations around research in terms of what we're approved to collect. So we we try in, in every case we can to collect the least amount of identifying information um, or information that um, we are not approved to um, sort of keep and gather and um, store. Um, the other option is, so I mentioned that, you know, we have no video, we've got these private chats, folks can speak aloud and come off mute within the meeting settings. But, you know, sometimes a group setting is just not for everyone. And so we do have options for interviews um, to be available, which is that, that setting one-on-one -on -one conversation between someone like myself as a facilitator um, and an individual. Um, and that's also um, a great way that we're able to accommodate accessibility needs, right? We certainly wanna make sure that the focus groups are offered in a variety of languages, um, and so depending on um, how many individuals um, attend each of the groups, we accommodate each of those sets of needs um, based on um, what comes to us. And so we're incredibly flexible in that way that, you know, if we have a group of individuals that would like um, a particular language to be offered, then we'll go ahead and offer that in that language. Um, and so that is not on the eligibility screen for a reason. Um, it's because we are, you know, sort of adapting to whomever would like to participate um, in this study. And then the last piece I wanted to highlight is that we do follow uh, trauma-informed principles. Um, and so we are you know, all experienced and trained um, in using trauma-informed practices within these groups. Um, we do cluster individuals in the groups um, that's it's self-selected. Um, and some of them are based on victimization type. Um, some of them are based on culture or community. And it's really to provide that setting, knowing that all of the individuals in the room likely um, are not aware of each other. It, we want to establish comfort and an ability to share um, pretty quickly in these groups. They, they last about an hour, um, give or take a few minutes. And so that is a very quick amount of time, as you know, um, to feel comfortable sharing about um, your service provision. And so we do want to um, group people that may have some commonality um, to ease some of those boundaries and, and allow for more comfort in sharing. Another question you might be thinking about is how do you ensure confidentiality and privacy, right? There's all these different angles that 
we have given consideration to um, in terms of how we've sort of structured the work that we do um, and how we are conducting these focus groups in a way that allows for folks to feel comfortable sharing with someone like myself that they've never seen before. Um, and um, in a way that as we collect information and it's you know protected and um, useful to the study, um, are we focused on a particular question for everybody? We wanna make sure that there's some um, common questions across all different groups so that we can understand how that response might differ by group to group, because um, that is also important to the study. And so the process that we use um, and that we've applied here is called a double blind approach. Um, and so that is an approach that we've um, utilized in other settings to really ensure that, again, we're not collecting information that we don't need to be collecting, um, to understand that um, uh, contact information, for example, is something that um, is not necessary for most of the work that we're doing um, with this study. And so it allows folks to be referred to us um, and that they can engage with us without us having to sort of gather their contact, contact information and talk with them. Um, it also allows for um, it to be blind in the other way where service providers, um, if they're the ones that are sort of getting folks connected and engaged with the study, um, they're also not aware of who um, is engaged. And so it creates kind of these silos um, of information and engagement um, to help um, layer in protections. Um, and so ICF um, and our team, we don't record names of participants unless um, there is some need to do so. And, and what that means is we do go through a consent process um, that walks through a description of the study, um, why we're conducting the study, the kinds of questions that we're gonna be asking, the, the types of information that we're collecting, um, what our incentive process um, looks like. Um, and then toward the end of um, the session is when we collect things like demographics um, from everybody um, that is willing to share. Um, and then we go through the process of administering an incentive. Um, we have a variety of options available for that incentive. And one thing um, is that there is an option to mail the incentive to the individual, to email it to the individual. And that's where there's that boundary, where if a participant really prefers to have the physical gift card mailed to them, we do honor that um, and, and go through a process of letting them know that in order to do that, we do need a safe address to mail it to. Um, and so that's the one time when we do collect contact information. Um, at the end, it is absolutely um, sort of de-identified. And what I mean by that is that it's not matched up to the data itself. Um, and so um, connection back to what that individual has shared about cannot be made. Um, and it is um, sort of collected and uh, stored in a separate um, place from all of the data that um, we are gathering through these focus groups. And so we create these um, very purposeful partitions um, and have these processes in place um, to ensure that when we do collect names or any identifying information it is um, in a completely separate place. Um, and I would say in most cases, having done this in many states, um, it's, it's fairly rare that folks select that as an option, but we do have um, individuals that do prefer that um, gift card to be offered um, or, or mailed um, to um, a home or a safe address. Um, and so we do um, include that as a as an option. We recommend though the sort of virtual way that we can share um, incentive codes so that we can provide it to individuals without asking their name um, and contact information. So that's kind of what we offer first. And then as an alternative, we have these other options available. And then again, just um, ensuring that throughout um, this video, sharing that service providers will not be um, informed of which clients do attend, um, which clients do contact us, um, that is all kept confidential. Um, and there's actually no scheduling required. So I mentioned that there are um, a variety of groups offered and there are sessions offered 
um, sort of early in the day, um, throughout the day. Um, we have sessions offered in the evenings and on the weekends. And so really just trying to um, offer as many dates and times as possible to accommodate um, everyone's schedule. Um, but we are not scheduling individuals in a way where we have to co uh, collect their contact information to actually put them within a group. Um, and so we do have an ability to um, sort of partition groups if they get too large, focus on smaller groups. Um, it's really um, uh, for each victim and survivor to select which group um, works best for them. And we've even had times where, um, you know, there are a number of offerings available. And if someone can't make one, they hop into the next. And so um, it really is a flexible process. Um, and then um, there is no sharing of names um, with each other, um, no direct chat I mentioned. And so even once folks do join into these groups, Again, we're encouraging them not to say their own name as they describe things or to share fam family members' names. So we do through that consent process and sort of that opening setting of, of talking about what this um, focus group will um, uh, sort of feel like and what we're going to be talking about. We do uh, talk about sharing and how to hold some of that information back um, so that we don't um, accidentally have information um, that we should not. Um, and again, there's no video, there's anonymous login. These are all ways that we're, you know, ensuring confidentiality and, and privacy um, within these settings. Um, and, and that's another factor in um, the focus on service provision um, and not on victimization. Um, we wanna really make sure that um, even in a case that's incredibly unique, right? So any detail that, um, would be shared could be identifying. And so we want to um, guide folks to sharing insights that um, would not be um, identifiable to other folks in the room or to myself as a facilitator um, or in the work as we report out the findings. Now, everything that we do um, in a project like this, while we share back the findings in report form and other settings um, with whether it's MOVA or service providers across the state, um, we talk about everything in what I would call the aggregate, meaning um, we're sharing summaries. We might share quotes if folks do give us permission to do so. But in any of those cases, the way that we share back sort of these thematic summaries of the information, it's very much focused on ensuring that any reader that picks up our report or looks to the findings cannot disentangle which individual um, shared about um, that particular experience. Um, and so if there is a uniqueness to something that is shared in these groups, um, part of our role um, as the, um, the researcher is to ensure that we're reporting back in the way that protects the confidentiality of those that are um, included in these focus groups. Um, we do ask permission to record the sessions, um, and that is purely for note-taking purposes. Um, we do have to sort of go around and make sure that everyone agrees to it. We don't want one person um, being unsure or um, not wanting audio recording um, to get missed, and so we do sort of work through the whole group to make sure that everyone um, uh, has an agreement in that. And you know, if there's one person that doesn't, we do not record. Um, so we make sure that consent is received from all participants. Um, and um, just sharing that that recording is not linked to any identifier. So sort of when you think about a meeting like this and when does um, it come into play that we actually start the recording, all of sort of those onboarding steps that I talked about with um, talking with folks in a separate room and making sure that they have a code to participate in are eligible. None of that is recorded. It's really just the, the question and answer part portion um, of the focus groups. Um, and so that's what I mean by not linked to identifiers. Even the, the latter portion where we administer the um, the demographics questions and um, the incentive, those are not recorded as well. And then in terms of what do we do with that recording, like I said, it's, it's for note taking purposes. So we do go ahead and transcribe each of the sessions and then we do securely um, destroy those recordings to make sure that we're not keeping them for long periods of time, that they're not um, sort of in a place where others can access them. Um, part of that time element is 
um, as researchers, you know, we really try to transcribe them, um, get them into a de-identified de state, right? There might be something that was accidentally shared um, on the audio recording. We're going to go ahead and redact that in the sort of permanent record that we have um, for the session. Um, and so there's lots of processes we have in place there to um, protect the data that we are collecting. And so the next question is really about safety precautions. So what are the safety precautions? Um, just thinking about folks virtually participating, right? So um, traditionally we've done a lot of focus groups in person. So we're thinking about um, like which building do we go to? Is it a safe space? Do folks have to travel outside their community? But with virtual focus groups, there are still safety precautions that we really need to introduce to make sure that you know, everyone is able to participate, that they, they know what we're going to be asking so that when they're, you know, sort of in this setting like we are right here, that there aren't others hearing the conversation um, that should not be. Um, and so virtual participation is really encouraged from a safe location. And so we just want to make sure that in those instructions and just as folks are starting to consider whether to participate in focus groups, that they're thinking about um, where they're going to go ahead and make that connection. Are they going to be doing it um, from a work location? Are they going to be doing it from a community center? Are they going to be doing it at home? And do they have childcare at that time? Um, and just giving some um, sort of space for them to consider um, what would be the, the best time, the best location um, for them to sign on and have this conversation with us. Um, we do not post the meeting information sort of anywhere online. So when we share that out with service providers, um, that's kind of where it lives, right? So it's um, calendars of options and login information that are um, shared with service providers as that sort of layer of protection. Um, and so there's no flyers um, to be hung in um, service provider locations. Um, I know many of you may um, be doing services in person and others may still be doing them virtually. Um, we just wanna make sure that we um, protect that space as well um, and that um, service providers are sort of that entry point and that they're um, sort of making the connections with folks and, and helping to determine the eligibility. Um, and then participation can stop at any time. Uh, so part of our consent process is to make sure that every participant is well aware that stopping at any, any time does not result in any sort of penalty. Um, I think you know a few times I've been asked, will I still get the incentive? Um, things along those lines. Really, we want folks to participate when they're they're ready to. It could be that they can answer one question and they have to go, or um, they were interrupted during the session and, and maybe they can come back for another. And so we really want to accommodate um, that flow and, and that um, timing for each participant. Um, we also have, just in terms of safety, um, protocols that are um, shared with participants. So we do walk through what some of those protections are in the consent process. So knowing what um, my boundaries are as a researcher, um, I am not a mandated reporter, for example, in my role as a researcher, but there are certain um, pieces of information that even as a researcher, I am bound to report. And so we want to make that really clear. We actually reiterate it at several points within the session, just so folks are aware um, of what um, we are here to collect and, and what we are not. Um, and so in terms of safety, you know, if individuals do share that they're going to harm them, themselves or others, that's something that we do proceed with reporting. We want to make that very clear at the outset. Um, and so that that is um, detailed in the consent process. Um, we also introduce um, safety words and I call them diversion questions here. Um, understanding that this virtual space may introduce um, other individuals that were not intended to be present or they may have come home during um, a virtual focus group. So we want to have steps in place that allow us to change course um, to immediately switch gears into something else. Um, if there is someone that um, should not be aware of a participant um, being included in this kind of conversation. Um, and so we introduce safety words so folks can guide us that they're now no longer in a safe location um, and that we do need to um, change course. Um, that can be simply on their end hanging up um, and then we do not reintroduce that phone number back into the setting. Um, it could also mean 
um, if someone is not able to hang up or that someone else has joined the line, um, that diversion into other questions. And so we do have a protocol where we switch to questions that are pretty generic um, and focused on a different topic um, so that if there is an introduction of um, an extra party, then um, to anyone that's participating, they it would just uh, seem like any any old focus group um, or um, meeting that's going on unrelated to the topic at hand. Um, also, there's no identifying information on the screen related to the topic. So for example, um, in the meeting header, we wanna make sure that that doesn't have anything that's identifying um, in the way that I put my title in there, um, my name, um, all of that as a facilitator, um, we give, um, you know, we really focus on each of these elements. We give it a lot of attention in terms of if someone were to step in from the outside, would they know what we'd be talking about? And just making sure that those um, safety precautions are in place. And then again, I talked about this consent process. So at the beginning, we're sharing a lot about the study um, and just really um, focusing on what we're going to be talking about to prepare each participant. But we wanna make sure that we give pause and we have some of these check-ins throughout the conversation um, to ensure that everyone is, is still doing okay, right? Um, and so we do between each section uh, based on the dynamics of the group, um, give some space for folks to um, share if they'd like to continue, if that was enough for today, um, and to just really get a read of the room. We also provide resources. So if you're a service provider, many of you um, are captured on our resource list. We refer folks to um, the master resource list that MOVA hosts on their website. Um, we really just wanna make sure that um, even in our role um, that we're um, ensuring that everyone is um, leaving with um, resources in hand. Um, if there were to be um, a particular aspect of the, the conversation that requires someone to be um, connected immediately. We do have protocols in place um, that are part of our processes to make sure we get folks connected before we part ways. Um, so we do have time at the end of each group or it can happen in the middle of the group, to be honest, um, to make sure if someone um, is just no longer feeling safe that we're making those connections as well and that we're not just sort of leaving the group um, and handing them sort of a list of resources at the time. And so sometimes this is making direct connections to folks like you all um, or um, sharing uh, ways that they can get connected, but we do take the time to, to make sure that um, sort of we wrap up that conversation in, in, a, safe, um, in a safe way. Um, I mentioned here the, the crisis protocol. So if, if something were to arise during the session, um, we do have a protocol in place that is approved by our institutional review board, the IRB that I mentioned before, to make sure that we have steps in place um, for us to engage as needed um, or to follow those mandated reporting guidelines. All right, so I shared a lot about the various groups and um, what they look like. So now is the time where I tell you how do you get connected? Um, how can you participate in the needs assessment? So if you are a service provider and here to learn about how to get your survivors and victims and clients engaged in the study, um, we have information here about contacting us at moveicf.com. Um, we are sending out information to everyone that's interested in helping get folks engaged um, via email. So if you haven't received that information from us, go ahead and reach out to us at that MOVA at icf.com email, and we'll get you a packet of information so that you can um, share about the study with the folks that you are serving. Um, as well, if you are a victim um, service provider or an allied professional and you haven't seen our survey, we would love to have you participate. Um, and so you can also use that email address to reach out to us uh, so that we can send the survey your way. Um, we do have the survey out in the field now. Um, and so now is the time if you'd like to share your insights as a provider. Um, and if you are a provider with lived experience and so you'd like to participate in the, the victim focus groups, um, there are opportunities there as well. So one um, 
uh, piece is that if you're a provider um, in the state of Massachusetts, you can't participate in the groups with other survivors, unfortunately, um, just to ensure that confidentiality layer is there. Um, and so we do have opportunities through interviews or a separate session for service providers with lived experience that you can share um, through that engagement as well. So again, I'm just gonna keep referring you all to the MOVA at ICF.com is a way to get connected with us. Um, and if you know for some reason you don't have that email handy and you feel like you want to participate in one of these sessions, um, you can certainly reach out to MOVA and they will get you connected to me as well. Um, we're really hoping for folks to share their expertise, their recommendations, and just all of these various perspectives um, throughout the study. And so the, the more folks we can get engaged, the more comprehensive and well-rounded um, our results will be. Um, if you have any questions, again, you can reach out to myself, Samantha Lowry, um, one of the principal investigators um, directly, and I'm going to go ahead and share my contact information as well, or um, Elena Henninger, um, who is my um, colleague here at ICF. She is also happy to answer any questions that you may have, um, or just reach out to that move at icf.com email. There might be questions that I haven't answered today. Um, that would be helpful to you. Um, and we're happy to, to dive into those with you. But thank you for your time. I appreciate you listening to this video and hopefully um, we're able to get connected and get you involved in the study. Take care. Bye now.